Hey everybody, what up? All right, so in this video, what I want to talk about is like a misconception that I had as a uh, developer when I was first getting started. And it's no different now, 14 years later. And it's something I think a lot of beginner developers probably don't know. So I'm just going to go ahead and point that right out. And that is that you can't jump into a complicated existing code base without some sort of context, meaning understanding, overall understanding of how all the pieces are plugging and playing together. So if anybody was like, okay, yeah, you want to learn how to be a programmer, go ahead and start contributing to some big open source project, get your name out there and, you know, understand all the ins and outs and all this stuff. And then you can, you know, be a contributor and everybody's going to notice that you'll get a job, make a bunch of money and all that. The thing is, is you really can't do that. It's just simply not possible. At least I would say for 99.9% .9 of all people out there. Unless you have absolute genius level capabilities that I can't even comprehend and or like you have actual on the job training or you have no life whatsoever, I guess, maybe outside of code. And, and that will only last you for so long because you will burn out. So if all you do is code all day long, every day, uh, you're going to burn out. You definitely will at some point. So when I was first getting started, I used to think I could jump into like, okay, I, I liked Python Django and actually Web2Pi was a, a framework that was competing with Django. I ever, Django was like the first real web framework I fell in love with. And this is after I switched from Perl to Python and I fell in love with Django. Uh, well, not, not at first actually. So I jumped into Django. I'm like, this thing's too complicated, too much stuff going on. Web2Pi was like an up and comer and I thought I could jump in early and like contribute a little bit. I'm like friends with the creator of that. I don't even know what, what's going on with that project, but the creator was a, um, a professor at the university in Chicago. And um, anyway, like we were like Facebook friends even now. I don't even know the dude really, but it was because I was jumping into programming. I was sort of being an active member, even though I couldn't really help anybody. Uh, but I was just like showing the enthusiasm and interest in the project early on. This was way, way back, more than 14 years ago, or maybe at least at least 14 years ago. So back then, I, you know, I couldn't jump into the project, and it was a much smaller project. It was nowhere near as complicated as Django. I think it was easier with just some really good documentation to get up and running quickly. And Django's documentation is like, it's, it's the, some of the best I've ever seen. So they've always done a really good job at documentation. But as a young developer, I just couldn't even understand it. There was just too much going on. So I tried to jump into the Web2Pi project and eventually I ended up switching back to Django and that's when I fell in love with Django and I started using Django. And really that, that was how I launched my projects that ended up getting me in front of managers and finally getting me, uh, convincing them to, to hire me as a developer. And then I was able to just work my way up from there. But the main point behind this video is that you just simply can't, even if you're experienced or you're not, like you can't jump into a middle of a code base and just start plugging away, at least in my opinion, not effectively. Now, Maybe if somebody's going to hold your hand and be like, dude, this isn't going to work because of this, this, and this, and eventually you bang your head against the wall a million times or a thousand times or something, you'll start being more uh, productive and then you can actually be a contributor at that point. But let's look at an example like React, right? One of the most popular front-end client-side libraries that are out there, it's for user interfaces, but it doesn't matter if it's for back-end, front-end, for embedded systems or whatever. Uh, we're just looking at React as an example. Pretty much every code base out there, there's only a limited number of contributors. So if we look at React, there's like 1,558 contributors. That, that means people that contributed to the source code. So I would be considered one of them for the Django project. And I didn't do anything with Django. I did like one contribution. And I don't even remember what it was, but it was nothing to do with the, the, the core code of it. Uh, but I would be listed as one of those contributors, even though I know nothing about it. Meaning I know nothing about Django's core code versus I know I didn't use Django, but I didn't actually write any of the core code. So if we look at the React example, we'll go ahead and click on contributors here in GitHub. And you can see it's a very active project, tons of stuff going on with it. It's continuing to grow. The number one contributor right now is Mr. Dan Abramoff. All right, so this dude, like he wrote Redux, he got hired by Facebook, and basically he's been running React since that time. So you can see he's all involved in React. And... I mean, he's really the face of React at this point. He's been that way, obviously, all the way back to 2017 at this point. Before Dan Abramoff, it was probably uh, Sophie here. So Sophie was the main person before Dan Abramoff. You could see that this is where they left. And um, she actually had some issues with the company. So like, uh, there's like news articles on that and stuff like that. But um, it's a totally different discussion. Sticking to the facts here, though, 
what my point is is that react itself is written by only a handful of people there's only a handful of people that truly know react's core code and can write new features of react and actually do it without breaking a bunch of existing stuff it, it, it when we go down this list that's about it like we stop so the, the react project is you could say you could argue here that it's basically five people maybe six uh six seven eight maybe eight people um it, it, and then if you wanted as we look into this if you want to count somebody that was really involved back in 2014 the point being is like you can't just jump into the react project no matter how good of a programmer you are and then just start writing a bunch of features it just doesn't work that way and the funny thing is is that it's not just with react it's basically like that with pretty much every project that is out there like if you look at all these different projects look on github look at the contributors there's always like one or two Here's a popular 3D library written in uh, WebGL. It's like a higher level WebGL. Mr. Doob is the, the genius level behind this. And, and I've always looked up to him as a programmer. Like he's the type of programmer I just can't compete with. The dude's got brain, brains that I just will never be able to compete with. But that being said, even this project with even more contributors has like just the same amount of core contributors. That's it. Like it, it Mr. Doob is basically doing the whole thing find any sort of github project that is truly uh distributed a amongst a bunch of different developers you'll be hard pressed to do it they just don't exist what is the point jumping into existing complicated ass logic that somebody else wrote is almost an impossible task unless you have a full context full training on what it is that is going on with that project there's so many edge cases cases in programming you'll never understand all of them if you haven't been involved, like thoroughly, thoroughly involved. So yeah, you can contribute to a major project. Like I contributed to um, Flask and Flask sitemap and Django. And uh, I did more with Flask sitemap actually, but like, um, but, but like something like Django, I can be a contributor to Django, but really I'm not, you know, I'm not like, I'm not even close. And, and it's not even like, I'm like, I'm like, I would be down on the bottom of that list. But the point being is like, it, it's like that, almost with every single complicated code base I've ever seen in my life, whether it's in a corporation or open source or whatever, there's always just a handful of people that have been there from the beginning or that have the full context, the full understanding. And then that's where they get that job security and they get the titles of like, Oh, this person knows more than everybody else and all this. But of course they would, they've been involved in it from jump street. So don't feel bad if you find that, I can't understand what is going on with a complicated code base because that is the situation with a lot of people. And that is why you find that programming can be really, really fun when you're building your own side projects because you are that core contributor. If you're learning the code, I recommend you check out my website, codehawk.com. My courses are fast to the point without the fluff that you'll find on other competitor sites like Pluralsight and Udemy. One of the reasons why you'll want to learn with me is that I'm a self-taught engineer myself. I never went to school for any of this stuff. I've been doing it for over a decade now professionally. The biggest reason you should use CodeHawk is that it's one price for everything. I try to make this as affordable as possible. Instead of having to purchase 15 to 20 different courses on Udemy or an expensive monthly subscription to Pluralsight, it's one price for everything on CodeHawk. Front end, back end, full stack. It has courses on all the latest web development technology. The courses range from beginner to advanced. So if you want to learn the latest web technology, give CodeHawk a look. There's demos for all of the courses that are out there right now. Uh, in addition, there's also my personal vlogs, which I'll be adding more to. So content that I don't release to YouTube is available on CodeHawk.